Welcome to All The Things, the unscripted podcast where we talk to intriguing people from a variety of cultures, backgrounds, and career paths and deconstruct who they are and why they think the way that they do. We dig deep and ask unexpected questions to learn about all the things from faith and current events to relationships and mental health. We want to satisfy your craving for knowledge, true connection, and real conversation. This is Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay Maestas. Hey everyone, it's Lindsay Maestas. Welcome back to the All The Things podcast. I am here with Lenya. Hey there. And our lovely guest today, Sarah Anderson. Hi. Hey, Sarah is based out of Georgia, and you are a daughter of a former Republican presidential candidate, Gary Bauer. So we're so excited to talk about this. The topic that we're kind of focusing on is how to mitigate conflicts when you and your family don't see eye to eye, which I would say maybe more than ever (laughs) is happening in our country right now. So I would love to hear just a little bit about your story. Sorry, what was it like being the daughter of a presidential candidate? How did it affect your life? Yeah, well, I grew up just outside Washington, D.C. in a very political family. So both of my parents um, moved to D.C. out of college to get involved in politics. They met working at the Republican National Committee. So they were like sold out for politics from the very beginning. And then I was um, I think my mom was pregnant with me. My my dad started volunteering on the Reagan campaign and then worked in the Reagan administration um, as undersecretary of education and then chief domestic policy advisor to the president. So all grew Growing up, I was really kind of in the Washington bubble and my dad was just kind of on the fringes enough of politics, not so much in the spotlight as much that we got all the perks for being involved. We got to go to like inaugural parades and the White House Easter egg roll. And, you know, we got to meet the president at one point. So it was all the fun stuff. And it wasn't until my senior year of high school um, when my dad, that was when he ran for president. So he threw his hat into the Republican nomination process. Um, It was April of my senior your year. And that really changed things for us because up until that point, it had been a a very positive experience for the most part in Washington. But um, besides kind of probably the typical teenage angst of like, I wanted my senior year to be all about me and now you're running for president, really like that kind of threw me a little bit. Besides that, there was just kind of this darker side that came with the overexposure um, and deciding to go into politics or, or to to go in, into it that way. Um, so the things that kind of really shaped that year the most for me was just the sense that we lost control over the narrative over our family. I think we learned very quickly that um, it was very easy for someone to take a sound bite out of context yeah. and um, create a story around it. Or, you know, if my dad was having a bad day and didn't do a great interview, there would be an entire you know group of people that would form an opinion about him based off of this one thing. And so there just was a sense of a lack of control over what people would think about you. And they would never really get to know us as a family. And that bothered me. You know, they could know what his opinion was on a foreign policy, but they didn't know that he would take the red eye home on Friday nights so he could watch my brother play basketball Saturday mornings. Like that was the stuff that made him my dad. And those are the things they don't want people to know because they want to skew a perspective. That's yeah. right. You you want it's so much easier to form an opinion about someone when you don't know the the um, individuality of that person or the yeah. personal things. Um, you don't know about the the families that they go home to at night. So not not having people know that about us. Um, was just really challenging. The other thing that kind of shaped me in that season and and really affected me to the point where I did not want to go back to DC after I graduated college. Um, You know, when it's a primary season in Washington, you're really used to having the Republicans versus Democrats, but primary season, it's Republicans versus Republicans and Democrats versus Democrats. You're all fighting for the same nomination. And so what was really tricky was watching people that you would normally consider friends or people that you would see as on your side, taking shots at each other and and becoming adversaries and how you talked about each other and treated each other. And that was really hard for me to see people that under any other circumstances, we would be teammates and we would be fighting for the same things. Mm -hmm. Under these circumstances, um, we were enemies and going against each other. And it just really brought to light for me how easily we other one another, how easily we look for the things to separate ourselves out from somebody else. And something about that just did not not, um, it didn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. Yeah. That is so much. You know, I want to talk about life in the fishbowl. Being married to a pastor, and he's a large church, and he serves on the board of Samaritan's Purse, and he was on Trump's or is on Trump's evangelical um, committee that has supported him. So I relate in a lot of ways in, in my own micro uh, cosm. Uh, yeah. Skip was in the Rose Garden for the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. Mm-hmm. And was your dad there? I think my dad was there. Yeah. yeah, because I think Skip was with the group that was with your dad. So I okay. think Skip knows him. But um, anyway, somehow... They took a picture of that and it was on a paper and then Skip is just tall. He's like six, five blonde hair. And so people started circling pictures and putting it on the Instagram. And mm-hmm. we had neighbors in our neighborhood. We were out walking the dog who yelled at us. Mm-hmm. I had someone who sent a horrible email that lives in my neighborhood and I'm like, wow. So on, on a certain level, I can relate, you know, yeah. to, to a minimal. But don't, don't you feel like they create a caricature mm-hmm. of who the person you love is? Yes, for sure. And it's so hard to um, act against type. Yeah. Because they're just looking for everything to, to put you in that mold. Yeah. And no matter what you do to try and normalize or um, relate or, you know, make yourself more faceted than, mm-hmm. you know, this mm-hmm. single thing. Yeah. How did you cope with that? I mean, did well, you feel, were you a scrapper, defensive? <laughs> <laughs> I probably do. I withdrew from it more than anything. You know, I went to college at a very small conservative Christian college where there were a lot of supporters of my dad. They would make trips to DC for rallies and I wouldn't go. I did not want to have anything to do with it because it, it was so personal for, to me at that point. I think the advantage that I had though was social media was not what it was, what mm-hmm. it is today. And so I think the experience that people have with politics when you're in the spotlight now is much different than it was 20 years ago um, for me. So I I think that was an advantage, um, but I think you just are having to keep uh, people, you got to keep your people close to you, right? You've got to know who your safe people are. You've got to, ha- I had great friends um, that knew me before my dad ran for president and knew me after he dropped out of the race and who I could call when he was impersonated on SNL. And I was like, what is happening <laughs> in my world? Like, this is insane. So I think um, you've got to know who your people are and who you can trust. Um, but you're right. I think that idea, the caricature for sure. I, I well, think obviously it- the, the ultimate, uh, height of being caricatured is to be on SNL. That's yeah. right. If you make yeah. it there and they're mocking you, yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Success exactly. in the world. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it, you, you really do start to, and I find myself doing it now too. It's so easy to think of the people on the screen as two dimensional figures. And we start That's to true. treat them like an Amazon product so that we can rate with five stars or one mm-hmm. star. And if they don't speak the language we want them to speak or say the words we want them to say, we can be dismissive of them. We treat them like a product instead of a person. And so remembering any way that we can, just remembering that there's more to this person than their political persuasion or the positions that they hold that there, yeah. there's a robust, you know, person involved here and not in a family and not just a representation of beliefs that yeah. come across a certain way. Yeah, I agree. So good. Um, I was thinking about the comment you made that when you, when he was running for president, then he's running against fellow Republicans and the um, whole different dynamic because yeah. you're saying stay with your circle of trust and yeah. your circle of trust now becomes carnivorous. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what, wait, I thought you were sheep. Yeah. Sheep don't need other sheep. Um, I remember David um, in one of the Psalms, Psalm 41 said, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Hmm. And I mean, that is almost Shakespearean, you know, yeah. to Brute, you know, that yeah. everybody's going to stab Caesar yeah. in the Senate. And then finally, your bestie is going to put the knife in, too. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. how devastating. Yeah. Um, how, how did your dad deal with that? Do you know? 
Um, I think he, th- my parents definitely felt the brunt of that more than we, than we did as their kids. Um, I think we experienced it through them and it was very hard. I mean, there were friendships that did not go back to how they were before. And it wasn't just, um, because people, it was, wasn't just against people that we were running against. It was friends who decided to endorse other people or why, and, and why they wouldn't endorse my dad or speak out on behalf of him, all these different, there were so many layers to it. And it was really hard to hear their political reasons for not backing one way or the other and to not take it personally. And the thing that we just experienced um, more than anything, what wasn't necessarily the attacks, the public attacks, but the distancing of, of relationships, right? Just the kind of the moving away and, and then having all this space to kind of fill in the gaps for why. Mm-hmm. And that was really hard to just kind of be like, what, you know, how could this have gone differently? Um, what did we do? What did we say? You know, all these different kinds of things, but it's just really messy. It's really, yeah, messy. I can be familiar with that too, as a pastor's wife. Um, Cause we've been in town for over 30 years. And mm-hmm. like she said, we have about 15,000 people. So people come and go. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be out doing something and a waiter goes, Oh, I used to come to your church. And you're like, Oh, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Where do you go now? Yeah. <laughs> why, why did you leave? Or, you know, they think they're being, you know, precious and sweet. And you're like, <laughs> and um, the same thing, you know, you'll hear, Oh, so-and-so left. You're like, they left. Why did they leave? Right. What did they do? And um, so I just learned, you know, first of all, they're not ours anyway. It's God's church. And when I say church, church universal, you know, my church, the one that we pastor is wonderful, but as as long as they're going to church, I mean, the greatest fear for us is you just want no one to leave the flock of God. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You would leave for the one, leave the 99 for the one to bring them back. But if they've gone to another place, you know, then there's nothing you can do. And then people will say things to me like, well, so-and-so is going to brand X, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I have learned, you know, to use kind words and to say, I hear the best things about that pastor. I've heard great things about that church. It's such a good church. I hear people really like this. So yeah, I try and um, speak kindness, Yeah, you know, and I don't know that anyone means it unkind. I mean, people are just pursuing, right. It seems more and more, whether it's a candidate, a church or whatever, people shop for boutiques, right? <laughs> they're, they're looking for the boutique that has the brand that they like. And That's right. That's um, right. I well, think the consumer has become more savvy and is like, you know, I'm going where I want my latte and they have oat milk. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you both mentioned the space, right? The spacing out of people and kind of it's like a drifting away is how I envision it. And Sarah, you recently wrote a book, The Space Between Us. And so obviously, oh. yeah, most people don't have a presidential candidate as a father, but most people do have differences in regards to their political viewpoints and their religious viewpoints. So Can you share, I know in your book, you talk about how faith and politics seem to be leading to more rage than change. And of course, we see that on social media. We see that even at the dinner table now. Can you share some of your insight regarding how you have learned to converse with um, your family and teach others to learn to converse with their families, children, parents, uncles, aunts, who do believe differently than them? Why are different beliefs, a good thing. How can we see it that way? And how do we learn to do it in a healthful manner? Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot there. Uh, I think the first thing is you're right, that there are a lot of people who are, I think all of us have had these relationships where there's tension, where we are experiencing differences in opinion and, and convictions. And I think that's, um, that's not a bad thing. I actually think that I would be more concerned if people are saying, I haven't experienced this at all, because that means we're living in echo chambers and yeah. we are only surrounded with like-minded people. And I'm not sure that that's healthy either. So yeah, to me, as uncomfortable as it can feel, the fact that we are experiencing some tension and conflict in our relationships tells me that we're surrounded by people who see the world differently than we do. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would be encouraged by that. Um, but I think that when it comes down to the real practical things, 
lives. Um, for me, one of the things I talk about in the book is, is figuring out what are the things that are worth engaging on, right? So I encourage readers to take an inventory of their beliefs, convictions, and opinions. And, and I define them by saying the belief, your beliefs are the things that are really core to who you are. They really make up your identity. You don't see um, your mind ever changing on some of these things that are very foundational to who you are. Um, your convictions are things you have very strong feelings about, but you also understand that people see them differently. They may have had a different life experience or a different um, you know, familiar experience that may have caused them to, to land on a different page. So even if you're not there, you understand that people landed there. And your opinions yeah. are things that you don't really have strong feelings about one way or the other, or you may not know that much about. So you could be talked or in or out of them. And just figuring out what are the things that are worth engaging in. So one of the things that we talk about in my family is don't attend every argument you're invited to. That mm, there are things you just need to be like, this is not for me to engage in. Be, maybe because it is a belief issue and I know I will get too emotional if I engage in this right now. So this yeah. isn't helpful. Sometimes the best on ramp is engaging with somebody on their opinion or something you don't have strong feelings about to be like, Hey, help me understand this position. Cause I, I honestly don't know a lot. So teach me what you know. And that can be a relational bridge on a topic that doesn't feel as personal or um, like it carries that much weight. So that can be a really good thing. But I think that the most important thing is to really keep in mind the posture that we have towards people to talk in a way that honors the person. Mm. Um, even if you can't honor the position they're mm. holding, that we're honoring the people who hold that position. That's and to good. remember, you know, that people are more than the sum total of their political beliefs. So when we only see them through the lens of who they voted for in the voting booth, then we're going to find every reason to continue to experience conflict and to try to change minds when ultimately our goal should be trying to understand the person and yeah. understand how they land where they did um, to have this this wanting to listen and to understand and to honor um, one another without having to be the same. So I think that's the first part. That's the really practical side of it. But when you talk about when you're asking why differing beliefs um, are a good thing, I think there's I think there's a lot there. I mean, I think when I when I think of the history of our country, you know, there's a reason why we are based as a democracy. A democracy is a diversity of ideas, and I think the founders knew that things could go sideways by by creating us to be this. But I think they also knew that there is so much potential. And when I think of the way that our system goes when it comes to elections and the transfer of power, I love the fact that we live in a country where the day after election day, people feel the freedom to say, I'm not happy with the decision that was made. Mm -hmm. That That's a really good thing. We do not want to live in a country where everybody falls in line the day after the decision's been made, because that tells me you don't feel safe enough to voice dissent. Yeah. And we live in a place where that dissent is okay and it's encouraged. And I think we need to be okay with it. I think the problem is when we begin to dehumanize the people in our conversations, not make Making, we don't want to make conflict the issue. We want to make how we handle the conflict the bigger issue. So if we can begin to do it in a better way, I, I don't think the diversity in opinion is bad. I think um, by having differing opinions, that's how we land on the best ideas mm -hmm. because they, people are able to point out our blind spots, point out the things that we would not necessarily see on our own. So I think there's something really good about inviting people into the dialogue that don't see things the way that we do because I think that's how we land in the best possible place. Yeah, and don't you think that so much of it too, I, I love everything that you just said. And I, as I pull from that, I think sometimes we take it so personally, mm -hmm. someone's political beliefs or even their faithful beliefs that yeah. we feel like it's a personal attack on us when it really has nothing to do with us. Yes, it has everything to do with what we believe and what we stand for, but that right. is the those are the convictions that we have on our hearts right. and we feel that they are right. But those people also feel the same way. And I think that right. just invites an opportunity for grace and understanding and conversation, which we just lack so yeah. much of to sit down yeah. and have a civil conversation because we're immediately defensive. And I, yeah. I just love that you're, you say don't attend every argument you're invited to because it's true. You're going to be invited to so many, especially in this season right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even it's funny, like my husband will come to me and he'll bring some stuff up. He's like, watches YouTube all day long, a ton of different people and different opinions. 
And there are things I completely disagree with that right. he's avid about, you know, and mm-hmm. it creates dialogue between us. It yeah. doesn't mean that he hates me because right. we differ in opinion. It doesn't mean I hate him or think he's mm-hmm. a horrible person. And we have similar morals and values yeah. and convictions. So there, but that's what keeps a relationship interesting. It's what allows me to grow and allows him to grow because we challenge perspective. So, um, yeah, I just think that's so good. And I, I fully am just such an advocate for taking the time to listen and understand because how else can you live and grow and learn? Yeah. And I I think the worst thing that we can do is argue about every issue because at that point we start to become white noise to the people around us. And when every hill is a hill to die on, then none of them are right. Mm -hmm. So if we want people to take us seriously on the things that really matter, then we've got to pick and choose the things that deserve our attention the most. Well, I think that um, I've heard people say also as Christians, we know that our greatest commission is to go into all the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we, treat that like a notch in the belt. Like that's all you're really doing is proselytizing Mm -hmm. when you're talking to people Mm -hmm. and recognizing that that can be so Mm off-putting. And, um, I've been reading Timothy Keller's book, the reason for God. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Brilliant. And Mm -hmm. uh, he made this quote, tolerance isn't about having beliefs. It's about how your beliefs lead you to treat people who disagree with you. And I think Christians in what you're saying with your amazing book, the space between us, and that is, is really trying to tell Christians to learn, you know, you draw more flies with honey, right? You know, that if we, um, Season vinegar. (laughs) Exactly. I was on a plane once. It was a bunch of uh, the women in the women's ministry were going to a Christian conference. And a friend of I got seated um, in between a woman who is probably in transition uh, to Mm -hmm. being transgender. And uh, so she asked me what I did. I'm a pastor's wife and you could just see her bristle. Mm -hmm. And I said, so are you pan? Are you trans? Mm -hmm. Like, where are you in the spectrum? And I think she was so shocked that I even know those terms and that I wasn't throwing them at there. But like you said, I was trying to understand. And so she was explaining to me, you know, where she was and, then I go, okay, well, how, what, what was your journey? I mean, how have you gotten to this place? He goes, well, my parents are, are Jewish and, you know, pretty Orthodox. And so it can be a lot. Mm-hmm. And I go, wow, I, you know, that's just such an unusual perspective, you know, coming from Orthodox, you know, Jews and, you know, Christians, obviously the old Testament, you know, I'm just making conversation and she goes, well, you know, I have a lot of questions about that, you know, good and evil and why would mm-hmm. God and, And we had the most amazing conversation and uh, she ends up, you know, she's like a comedian. And so like, here's my site, you should follow me. And, you know, it's pretty body humor, (laughs) um, but I did, I followed her for a while and I would leave things and she would talk back to me, but the conversation when she was asking about good and evil and all kinds of things, she said, you know, I never thought of it that way. Hmm. I never saw it that way. I, you know, and so she even had more follow-up questions, but instead of immediately off putting and, you know, us and them um, to just, like you said, the curiosity or talking about opinions and then getting to beliefs, right. It it just went a long way. It really did. You, you moved from, both of you could have written each other off as the categories you saw each other being in. But once you got to know the person behind the categories, then it was, Oh, Oh, well, now you're more complex than just this label of a pastor's wife or, you know, a trans person, that there was more to you than that. And that makes so much. Well, and I think that no other Christian had ever taken the time to answer her questions. Yeah. She really did have questions, but no one gave her the space to do it. And or the um, opportunity to ask. Yeah. 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 So I think both of us, you know, learned something that day. And, and, uh, anyway, yeah, it's, Well, and that's, and that is referring to kind of, I mean, there's so much throughout scripture of Christ's boldness and sharing truth, but also compassion and being an ear and being a person who will have the conversation and who will sit and who will listen. And that is civil discourse. So 
Um, Sarah, through your time kind of researching for your book and getting everything together to help people understand that civility is possible, how did you find that the Bible is a resource for civil, political, and religious discourse? Yeah, I think for me, it it really all goes back to the greatest commandment. The one thing that Jesus said mattered more than anything else was to love God and love people. And I think you can make the argument that the way you love people or love God is by loving people. So especially when we consider that Jesus said that what we would be known for as his followers would be how we treat each other and our love for one another. I just think somewhere along the way, we started to get confused and thinking that we would should be known more for our beliefs or known more for what we're against than what we're for. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think if we just go back to what Jesus is originally ha- talking about um, and our love for other people, he never shut people down for the beliefs that they held. Um, if people were curious and wanting to engage him, he was always willing to engage them back. And so I think that that willingness that he had is something that we could learn from, that we've got to get over this idea of people changing and being like us in order to engage with them. And instead, moving in their direction, a way to love them is by being present alongside of them, Um, not just assuming that they should make a change before they come to you about anything, but but meeting them where they are and knowing that everybody has a different starting place when it comes to faith or when it comes to their political positions. Everyone's life experience has led them to where they currently are and to taking that whole story into account and not just their current reality, I think is part of it. A so couple of things you've said, you know, is are you just in a circle of friends? You know, you're not joining a monastery when you become a Christian. You know, right. I think a lot of people think that, you know, yeah. that they just need to cut that out. Hey, and I understand, you know, when I got saved, I had been a bartender in a discotheque. I was a college co-ed and did a lot of drugs. So for me, I had to get away from it. There was yeah. a season that was good for me, yeah. but I can't stay there, you know. Right. But, um, you know, it's neat that Jesus, uh, people would say about him that he was the friend of tax collectors, wine bibbers, you know, and prostitutes. Mm -hmm. So obviously people, even in Jesus day, went, it's really weird. The friends Jesus had, have you noticed who he hangs out with, you know, and um, every once in a while, if you have a friend like that in your life, yeah. And then your other Christian friends meet them. They kind of look at you like, (laughs) what are you doing? Right. Yeah. But what a shame. How did we get so far from that? Isn't it interesting? We're it's polar opposite now. It is there's an immediate judgment when you're with someone. I'll never forget um Francis Chan talks about a lot in his testimony how he used to drive his friends bar to bar or pick them up um, so that they weren't driving. And he said, as long as I can share the gospel with you the whole way home, yes. and he's of course very passionate, but he said, as long as I can share that with you the whole way home, I don't really care. I'll pick you up every night. And he would, and he was so faithful yeah. in showing up for them and spending time. And he said, we would laugh and we would joke and everything was it was fine. You know, everything was fine. And people had opinions of that. People had opinions of me doing that, that I was enabling. And yet what he was doing was loving them, protecting them and Mm -hmm. sharing truth with them. And not that it needs to be in that circumstance necessarily, but that story always resonated with me because when I first became a believer, that was the conversation between some people where they would say, you know, so-and-so doesn't even have any non-Christian friends. And it goes back to what you're saying, Sarah, where I was like, wait, isn't that kind of not the purpose of Christianity though? <laughs> like to share and love and and be open and honest with other people about what you believe, but also yeah. reaching your hands out to the world. Yeah. That doesn't seem like the answer to me. And it feels like we've gone a little yeah. bit backwards. So for your opinion, can you share or just your, again, your research, how did Jesus lead by example in bringing people together who had differing beliefs, whether it's political, religious, lifestyle, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing he did that I think we tend to overlook is the the ministry he had of presence with mm. people, which is, I think, what we're talking about, I right? That. Yeah. that he was, wasn't was afraid to be with people, that it was more than just him, you know, performing, healing blind men or feeding the 5,000, that it was willing to take the time to engage in conversation. And that is a miracle in and of itself, right? Yeah. Christmas is God with us. I don't think we, we could emphasize that enough when it comes to the purpose of why he came was to be with 
us. I think we can have that same ministry of presence with people. Um, but I think the other thing is, you know, one of the, my favorite stories in scripture and is in Luke where there's these two different um, examples, I think, of how Jesus engaged two different types of people. So he's on his way to Jericho and there's a blind man who's calling out for his attention and wants to be healed. And Jesus heals him. And Luke is like, the crowd goes wild. The crowd mm-hmm. loves it. They're praising God because this blind man represents more than just this one man. Like this is Jesus reaching out to, um, uh, a, a, a group of people that's marginalized and that's not looked after and that's not cared for and isn't paid attention to. And he's saying, you matter. What I'm doing for you communicates that you matter. And then a little bit later, he's continuing on his way to Jericho and he comes across a tax collector named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus does the exact opposite. He does not call out to him. He's trying to hide because I think he knows that if he got Jesus's attention, Jesus would probably shame him or put him in his place in some way. He's probably expecting that that would be Jesus's reaction. And instead, Jesus calls out to him and says, I want to eat at your house tonight. And the thing that I had never noticed until I'd read this commentary talking about these two different stories was Luke says that when, when Jesus does this, the crowd grumbled. It was like immediately the crowd turns on him because Zacchaeus represented everything that the people did not want. He yeah. was part of the top 1%. He was part of the people who were doing the oppressing, right? He was overtaxing the Jewish people and pocketing the extra for himself. So he represented everything the people didn't love. And Jesus was still extending a hand of friendship and relationship to him. Mm. So I look at those two stories and I say, I think the example that Jesus gives us is that he just doesn't fit in the categories we want to put him in. And he's never willing to belong to one group that excludes him from the presence of another. So I think anytime that we find ourselves thinking Jesus is on my team, which means he can't be on your team, or he's with this group, which means he he can't be in that group. We need to be really careful. We need to pay attention to what that's telling us. I think that makes us more likely that we've made Jesus into our image than we're being conformed into his. Yeah. So I think this example of just getting uncomfortable with where Jesus spent his time and the people he spent time with, um, that to me is an indicator. If we're uncomfortable with what Jesus is asking us to do and the people he's hanging out with, then I think we're doing it right. I don't mm-hmm. think we should be too comfortable in what Jesus is asking us to do. So that to me, that story just really encompasses, he just doesn't fit in the boxes we put him in. And so we just need to quit putting him in there because he'll break out and make us uncomfortable every time. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I just love you. First of all, (laughs) we speak a similar um, language and I'm writing things. I always do when we're doing stuff and I was writing counterintuitive that so much of what Jesus did and counterculture, Mm. you know, we think about counterculture as, you know, hippies or whoever, Um, and really the, Jesus people are counterculture and counterintuitive. They really don't make sense or we shouldn't make sense. Right. And so I, I really love that you said that. And then the other thing is the ministry of presence. I, I have a ministry called reload love mm-hmm. and, um, it just came to me, oh, way back in 2013 or 14, um, when ISIS was on the scenes and, um, the Lord just told me collect spent bullet casings, turn them into brass, beautiful jewelry and help kids impacted by terror. Mm-hmm. And so I literally, you know, took the Lord at his word and I have found myself now in Jordan and in Iraq mm-hmm. and in some really dicey places yeah. in the world, ministering to people that are counterintuitive yeah. to all that I am and all that I think. And um, I would be in the jungles of Burma, you know, with these tribal um people that are very superstitious or anim animists or, you know, maybe Hindu. And, um, I'd be like, Lord, what am I doing here? Why, why am I here? Um, cause I'm really much more of a Malibu Barbie than a GI Jane. So it makes no sense for me to be in the places I've been, but someone said to me, the ministry of presence when this, um, really inept, white woman comes out of the jungle after two days hiking to get where these people are. And they're like, what are you doing here? (laughs) Well, what am I doing here? You matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, um, all those kind of things. And I remember being in Iraq and Mosul in a hospital and men or women are so separated. They have separate wards and, Mm -hmm. you know, just separate everything. If you know 
Islam. Yeah. And so we got to go in the little boys ward and dads or uncles were with the boys and they have such preconceived ideas about Americans, Christians, and we what were the little Satan or maybe we're the great Satan. I don't know which one is <laughs> States, which your dad did a lot for Israel as well. And my husband loves that too. But, um, this man just started crying. He was just weeping and almost embarrassed. And so I walked over with, um, an interpreter and he said, I don't know why you're here. Mm. You know, we hate you and our people are killing each other. And why would you come here? Why would you come here? Why would you do this? And I was able to share about the love of Christ. And I kind of, you know, shared Psalm 23 that, our God is the good shepherd, you know, and he goes for the sheep and that he's looking for them and he wants to carry them and find goodness and mercy and that he restores our soul. And as I'm telling these things, he's just crying more, but also it's a terrifying time. Mosul had not fallen. People would drive bombing cars down the street to the hospital. I mean, you just had to search people when they came in. It was all just a dicey time. And when we're in anxiety, I, the only thing I can think of are like pets. You know how they talk about when your dogs have anxiety, you should put one of those thunder vests yeah. on them because it mellows them out. Yeah. And I just, I felt like the Lord said to me, and really men don't touch women in that culture either. You don't even really look them in the eye. Mm-hmm. But I felt like the Lord said, put your hands on his shoulders because the anxiety is so high. Mm-hmm. It's like he's floating away. You know what I mean? It's just, mm-hmm. I could feel it. So I just kind of waited him. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing behind it. And you could tell he was starting to calm Mm -hmm. and just the ministry of presence, just being there and, and like holding him and speaking truth over him and being able to listen to his story. And, and, you know, it was, um, again, it's counterintuitive. No one pictures, uh, like I said, a 60 year old, um, blonde, white female to show up in the uh, war zones of Iraq and just be present. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, like you were saying with Jesus, just his very presence, both volumes. And um, I guess, you know, that's just really good for our listeners to be more present with people not like you. Right. You know, if, you, if any of you have nothing to say, even if you're just going to give them a hug or a handshake or whatever it is, you know, um, I highly recommend it because I think it's, it melts people. Yes. And it's it's honoring the image of God in them. And I think that's what I think when we too easily put Jesus and our group to the exclusion of somebody else, it's too easy to demonize the other group. But yeah. when we can see this all as being image bearers, that there's immediate connection there that we can draw out and, and pay attention to. Well, yeah. and I think we've talked about this too before, Lenya, on this podcast, but just how having someone at your dinner table even if they believe differently, changes the direction of the conversation in comparison to doing it over a screen or (laughs) even a text message. But having uh, that face-to-face connection and realizing you are a human being, that Mm -hmm. presence to being mm-hmm. with them, being, um, seeing them, like you're saying, Sarah, the presence of the image of God in your yeah. home and knowing you are called to love others as you love yourself, which we give ourselves a whole lot of grace and a right. whole lot of <laughs> understanding, but to right. just sit and, and to open your home, obviously when things are safe to do so, right. um, but opening your home to people who may believe differently. I actually, I don't know why this story is coming to mind, but I had somebody who really attacked something that I posted years ago about motherhood. And it was kind of just my perspective of what I was walking through in that season. And she had written something in response about, um, well, I don't know what it was. Try running a fortune 500 company and being a mom and then come back to me. And, but then she just went off. Turned out she was a family friend of my husband's and we were so confused by it all because my post was very much about my convictions and what the Lord was teaching me and my struggles. And so it was, you know, it hit something in her, I guess, but we had invited her to dinner after her very, angry comments. And that was more my husband. I will not give myself credit for that because I, I wasn't feeling it at the time, but he just said, let's just like, this is so weird. This isn't her character. Um, let's just sit down and 
just face to face. She wouldn't come, but it did provide the opportunity to speak on the phone, which then really, um, it just took away the heightened drama of it all and created the opportunity for more conversation. It didn't fizzle it out, but I think that, like I said, praise, not praise to him, but kudos to him, my husband, but that intentionality with that person, that mindfulness of, okay, I can take this and I can get so angry. Like we're talking about with political discourse. Um, I can get so angry at this person right now, even though I've known them and loved them for 15 years, I'm going to let this destroy my relationship because I'm taking their word at face value, their words at face value. I am taking them as a personal attack, like we said before, or you can say, I'm going to ring you up and I'm just going to have a phone call or I'm going to invite you over for coffee. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about this. Like I just challenge people don't even go there over a screen. Don't allow a 20 year relationship, 15, 10, five year relationship to be damaged. Allow that ministry of presence like Lenya and Sarah are talking about to be what drives you, to be what guides you and to be that example of Christ, even in discomfort. He is the leader of discomfort. Everything he did was uncomfortable, but to live in that I think is huge. And so we, Lenya and I, it's so important for us to call people up. And that's one thing that we believe Jesus did. He didn't call people out with harshness or accusations. Mm -hmm. He called them out, but then he called them up in love. So how can you, Sarah, encourage today our listeners to be a part of the solution toward peace within their own families when these differences do arise? Yeah, um, I would say a couple of things. I think I would um, first say, I think we need to get comfortable with the idea that maybe we are wrong on some things, Mm -hmm. that that posture of humility that we might need to be learners about things. Um, Yeah, I watched a TED Talk from several years ago, uh, Catherine Schultz, I think her name is, and she asked people in the audience, what does it feel like to know you're wrong? And people would throw out answers like they were embarrassed or humiliated or ashamed, you know, all these different things. And then she said, no, that's what it feels like when you discover you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Being wrong without knowing it feels a lot like being right. And I just think that none of us are holding wrong positions on purpose. All of us are holding the positions we hold because we wholeheartedly believe they're the right ones. Mm -hmm. But I think we'd be doing ourselves a disservice um, as Christians and as individuals to not continue to be learners and to not continue to be changing and growing. And that might mean changing our opinions on some things and and being okay with that. So I think there's a humility there that we need to embrace, um, being okay with being wrong and being learners of others. And I think we need to be um, peace seekers. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the um, organization Preemptive Love, but they do yes. some. I love them in the in the Middle East as well. I was thinking about them when you were talking about them, Linnea. And um, Jeremy Courtney, the founder, I, I've heard him say this that you know we want to be peacemakers, but peacemakers involves two sides being willing to make peace. Yeah. Peace seekers is really all we can be responsible for. We can't control what the other side um, is willing to do or not do, but we can constantly be pursuing peace. I think Paul talks about it as, as much as it depends on you live at peace, but that clause is so important as much as it depends on you. Like we yes. are only responsible for ourselves. So don't cut out that relationship too soon. Do what you can, but also don't put too much of a burden on yourself if it can't be fixed either. So knowing that we can seek peace as much as we can and leave the rest up to God there. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I would say is, Um, to not give up on each other. You know, I come from a very political family and we don't see eye to eye on everything anymore. As we've gotten older and and kind of moved in different directions, we can sometimes have heated conversations (laughs) around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Um, That's how it goes. But I'm a mom. I have an 11-year-old and an eight-year-old and I don't want my kids growing up thinking that civility is dependent on sameness. I want them to know that we can be kind to each other and celebrate the things that don't make us the same. So I would say, don't give up on those relationships. Look for the lowest common denominator of commonalities that we share with people and really hone in on them. And they don't have to be serious things or, you know, spiritual things. You know, my family, we love watching stand up comedy. That's something that we can bond over. We'll watch something and we can laugh together. And sometimes that's enough. So look for the things with people that you have in common and that you can celebrate and lean into those. Because I think that connection is spiritual, even if the means is not necessarily. 
so good. And again, I'm writing copious notes as you talk. <laughs> And we're just learning from you. <laughs> the similar, similar language that we speak, and um, I, you're just delightful. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do speaking? If I had you come to a women's thing, yeah, I do some. I, I, I work at a. I write curriculum for students, so I do some yeah. stuff with um, for for high school students. But yes, yeah, since I've written this book, I've done more speaking. Well, I would be fascinated to experiment. Maybe when we have a little more openness with COVID, <laughs> yeah, freedom. <laughs> Uh, we always do a Mother's Day and a Christmas yeah. thing, but I could work something else. We'd love to have yeah, you. Come that would be an honor. And talk to them. That would be so good. Awesome. But as I was listening to you and civility versus kindness, that's so awesome. I'm, I'm going to work on that. And I have a son who's grown and I want to work on that. <laughs> but um, I was also thinking about, you know, don't be with people who are like you. Pursue people who aren't like you. And, um, you know, there's this parable that a king is having a wedding and he goes and invites all his friends. Right. Mm -hmm. And they like ghost him. Right. They don't show <laughs> up. And um, they're like, yeah, whatever. And the, and the guy's upset. He's really mad, like maybe in politically when your friends aren't there, <laughs> they were going to be. So then he says, go to the highways and the byways and find them, invite anybody, you know? And so it says that his servants did and they went out and they found both bad and good. Mm -hmm. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to really encourage that the people listening today, would you please find other Mm -hmm. Something that's other than you. And and maybe it's too much for you to have them come to your house. I have brought home homeless people before. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad, I was talking about Christmas and he's like, I'm really nervous about COVID and I do not want you bringing home <laughs> <laughs> someone off the street. I go, promise dad, I promise I won't do that. There's some things I just have not lived down. And, um, but there are certainly ways that you can do that. Even in your own church, there are people who are not like you. Yeah. And they're feeling isolated and they are feeling um, left out and misunderstood. And so invite them for coffee or something before or after church. There are just so many ways to do that. Yeah. Um, even if it's just walking up and saying something kind to somebody, you know, that's that, that's different from you. I just think it's so Jesus, you yeah, know, yeah. that he was like, OK, his B list became his A list. That's right. And uh, wouldn't that be neat? I yeah. once was speaking to a woman that did um, interviewing for CNN mm -hmm. and um, she was very liberal. I think she was Catholic, uh, no, Jewish mm -hmm. and just so different. And she goes, do you think we could have coffee sometime just because I don't have friends that are different than me? Wow. So it doesn't just happen to Christians. Yeah, it yeah, happens yeah. to all of us. We all try and find sameness. And um, I don't think sameness, it brings growth. So, no. amen. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for sharing your heart and your perspective and um, allowing us to have this dialogue. I think it's so, so prevalent and important right now into the way that we are kind of going into this next year that, yeah. wow, what a difference it would make if we just shut things down um, in a way that is filled with love, that we yeah. are shutting down the anger and the wrath and instead yeah. choosing understanding and grace and open-mindedness. So um, we're yeah. just very thankful. And Sarah's book, The Space Between Us, is out now. Can you tell everyone where they can find your book and also where they can find you? Yeah, um, the book can be on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, target.com. Just Google it. It'll show up somewhere. Or there's even a, a website, I think, bookshop.com, if you want to support local independent bookstores oh, and not buy from a big box. You yes. can do that as well. Um, and then my website is sarahbanderson.com. And I'm on Instagram as sbanderson and um, Twitter, Sarah B. Anderson. So Perfect. any of those places you can find me. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. You guys thank go you pick so up. Much for having um, me. Of course. Thanks for coming on. And we hope to see you in Albuquerque. That yes, would be yeah, so that awesome to have, so you. Cool. <laughs> to have you. All right. Bye, guys. We'll see you next Tuesday. Well, now that we're off. This for behind the scenes videos and photos, as well as info about our upcoming guests, follow along with us on Instagram at allthethings.podcast. You can keep up with Lenya at at Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay at at Lindsay.maestas. If you'd like to listen to past episodes or learn more about us, visit the all the things podcast.com.